It is now the 16th century, and both Rome and the church are about to be transformed. This is Rome, a history in images. We are now in the 1500s. It is clear to most people that the Catholic Church has been populated by many saints over the last 1500 years. It is also clear especially since the popes and bishops became landowners and the papal states were created that corruption has crept in via those using the church to seek both power and money. These include conspiring individuals and very wealthy families. The wealthy families allow for beautiful churches to be built but they also bring corruption. Certain people call for reform. The Reformation begins. Martin Luther is a German monk who decides that faith alone is necessary for salvation. The only true authority is scripture, sola scriptura. The church responds by excommunicating Luther. Luther responds by burning the papal bull that condemns him. Luther dismisses the authority of the Pope and bishops altogether. The Lutheran Church is born. Many Christians join in the protest against the Catholic Church and its corruption and its theology. They are called Protestants. Many Protestants become iconoclasts, raiding churches and destroying images. In Protestant countries, monasteries are closed, since monks are seen as unproductive and therefore worthless. Hostilities between Protestants and Catholics grow. Protestants kill many Catholics, and Catholics kill many Protestants. In the midst of all this, the popes have to contend with other powers seeking to encroach upon Roman territory. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V is a devout Catholic but is equally passionate concerning Habsburg claims to territory in Rome. Remember Castel Sant'Angelo? It was the mausoleum of Hadrian that eventually became a fortress used by the popes. Now, in 1527, Pope Clement VII needs this structure to save his life. On May the 6th, Spanish and German soldiers, supporters of Charles V, launch an attack against Rome. They make their way up the Borgo Santo Spirito to St. Peter's Basilica. Special guards of the Pope from Switzerland, called the Swiss Guards, courageously defend the Pope. Out of 189 Swiss Guards, most are killed on the steps of the high altar of St. Peter's. There are 42 who survive, only because they are busy moving and protecting Pope Clement VII, who makes his way to the Castel Sant'Angelo via a special elevated walkway called the Passetto di Borgo. The Pope makes it safely to the fortress. For the next eight days, the Spaniards raid Rome for spoils, even breaking into many tombs of the popes. A mock religious procession is set up in front of the Castel Sant'Angelo, during which the soldiers demand that the chair of Peter be ceded to Martin Luther. Eventually, the pope pays a fine to make the violence stop. Today, the Castel Sant'Angelo is a museum. Let's visit there now. Here we can still see the ramp where the funeral procession of Emperor Hadrian passed by nearly 2,000 years ago. We can also see armaments and other artifacts from the time when the popes used this as a fortress.
It is now the middle of the 16th century. The Catholic Church needs reform. Pope Paul III summons the Council of Trent in 1545. It meets during three time frames and addresses both the abuses of authority by the bishops and doctrinal questions that need to be clarified. It decrees a uniform celebration of the Mass, issues a catechism, and condemns Protestant errors. Meanwhile, some of the greatest saints in the history of the Church lived during this century. They include St. Charles Borromeo, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. Ignatius Loyola. And Rome? It is in somewhat of a mess. Abandoned buildings from the fallen Roman Empire litter the landscape. Certain areas of Rome are often neglected and sanitation is poor. Constantine's great St. Peter's Basilica is now over 1,000 years old. And yet, there is a great promise in a new generation of talented artists and architects who bring with them great promise, the promise of a true renaissance. In 1505, Pope Julius II commences work on a brand new St. Peter's Basilica. The old one is slowly demolished over many years. It is still standing when the above-mentioned attack on Rome occurs in 1527. Progress is slow and delayed. Pope Paul III starts work again in 1534, but the architect he hires dies, and then his replacement architect dies as well. It is then, in 1546, that a very talented artist is hired. Forty years before, he had painted the Sistine Chapel when in his early thirties. His name is Michelangelo, and now, in his early seventies, he designs most of the new basilica. Michelangelo is still alive when the dome is started, but dies before it is completed. Remember the Circus of Nero, where St. Peter was crucified? And remember the old obelisk that was there. Well, now, in the 1500s, the obelisk is still there, and Pope Sixtus V has it moved to the front of the new St. Peter's Basilica, even though at this time there is no St. Peter's Square yet. To this day, the obelisk is called the Silent Witness, referring to its witnessing the crucifixion of St. Peter. Pope Paul V finishes the demolition of the old St. Peter's Basilica, and the brand new basilica is consecrated in 1626 by Pope Urban VIII, 120 years after its construction began. St. Peter's Square, with its magnificent colonnade by Bernini, is completed in 1667. We will visit the major basilicas of Rome, including this new St. Peter's Basilica, in the last episode of this series. For now, though, let us visit some other churches of Rome. The Jesu is the main Jesuit church in Rome. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, once prayed at the previous church that was here. This current church houses Ignatius's tomb. San Benedetto in Piscinola. This little church is quite easy to miss and is almost invisible compared to the gelateria or ice cream shop that is next door. There was a house belonging to the family of St. Benedict that was built on the site of a small pool used at an ancient Roman bathing facility in Trastevere, and this little church was built on the site of that house. It is said that St. Benedict, as a young man before he became a monk and the founder of Western monasticism, used to pray in front of this image of the Madonna and Child. The ornate floor dates from the 16th century. The name San Pietro in Vincoli means St. Peter in Chains. Not surprisingly, the chains that held St. Peter when he was imprisoned are located at the main altar. Also located here, off to the right, is Michelangelo's famous tomb of Pope Julius II. A failed attempt to make a spectacular tomb of 50 carved images to honor the Pope, the project was much too big even for the new St. Peter's Basilica. So the failed tomb was scaled down repeatedly until it became what you see here. Pope Julius himself is buried at St. Peter's at the Vatican, while this scaled-down work of art was moved here to St. Peter in Chains. 
A sculpted likeness of a reclining Pope Julius can be seen at the top, while at the bottom is Michelangelo's famous sculpture of Moses. Dedicated to both St. Ambrose and St. Charles Borromeo, this basilica was built in 1612. The canonization of Borromeo two years before is what prompted the construction of this church. This beautiful church of San Pataleo was built in 1681. Here reside the tombs of blessed Pietro Cassani and of St. Joseph Calasans, the founder of the Pyrists. This cute little dog waits patiently for its owner to return from our next church, San Silvestro in Capite. Dedicated to Pope St. Sylvester I and meant to house relics of Christians buried at the catacombs, the first church was built in the 8th century and remnants of that first church are incorporated into the walls at the entrance. This new church was built in the 16th and 17th centuries. Below the main altar are located the mortal remains of Pope Sylvester I, Pope Stephen I, and Pope Dionysius, as well as of Tarsisius, the famous boy martyr of the Eucharist, who was beaten to death by a crowd when they learned that he was carrying the Blessed Sacrament to his fellow Christians. St. Barbara of the Library gets its strange name from a guild of booksellers and publishers, which took possession of the church in the early 17th century. Eventually left in disuse and disrepair, a group of young people took interest in restoring the church in 1974. The building was reconsecrated and was used once again as a church starting in 1982, going right up until the present day. A convent church built in the 17th century, the Church of Santa Maria in Monterone, is run by the Redemptorists. Santa Maria del Orto was built in the 1500s with an impressive Baroque-style interior. Santa Maria in Via was built in the 1500s. A certain cardinal had a house here long ago, and one evening the well on the property mysteriously overflowed, producing an icon of Our Lady that was discovered floating on the water. Deciding this was a miracle, Pope Alexander IV ordered that a side chapel be built in this church, right on the spot of the cardinal's old home. This chapel of the well houses the icon. St. Louis of the French was built in the 1500s and is the National Church of France. Dedicated to St. Louis IX, King of France. A side chapel dedicated to St. Matthew has no less than three masterpieces by Caravaggio. The Calling of St. Matthew, The Inspiration of St. Matthew, and the martyrdom of St. Matthew. The Spanish Steps are a popular tourist attraction here in Rome. Built in the early 1700s, these elegant steps connect two squares, or piazze. At the top of the stairs is this church, Trinita de Monti, built in 1585. Located at the end of this narrow street, Santa Maria dell'Orazione e Morte is the home of a confraternity founded in 1538 to give proper burials to abandoned bodies whose families were either dead or could not afford to give their loved ones a decent burial. Pope Julius III made sure that the new group would give proper burial for these deceased and pray for the repose of their souls. Alas, the church was closed for renovations when I visited, but the outside is quite impressive, including these famous alms boxes, which date from 1694. Dedicated to St. Catherine of Siena, this church was built in the 17th century and is the main church for the military ordinariate in Italy. Located in the famous Piazza Novona, the Church of St. Agnes in Agony was built in the 17th century on the site of her martyrdom, 
which at the time was a stadium for athletic competitions. St. Agnes was put to death by the sword perhaps when she was only 12 years old. This occurred in one of the archways of the stadium. This beautiful church stands on that spot and celebrates the saint's heroism and her purity. It was designed by the famed architect Francesco Borromini. The dome depicts St. Agnes being welcomed into heaven. Santa Maria in Portico in Campitelli is a beautiful 17th century parish church. It was built to house this icon of Mary, an image which was believed to have miraculously stopped an epidemic. The remains of St. John Leonardi, who died in 1609, are located here. Santa Maria Sopra Minerva is a church dedicated to Mary built on the site of an ancient Roman temple of Minerva. The exterior showcases a small obelisk from 6th century BC Egypt. The base of the obelisk is an amusing elephant dating from the 1600s. Designed by Bernini, it was actually carved by one of his students, Ercole Forata. The interior was undergoing a major renovation when I visited. This was going on for nearly two years, and it was quite extensive. Still, some of the church's beauty can be seen amidst all the scaffolding. Almost hidden is this beautiful and famous statue of the Risen Christ by Michelangelo. St. Prisha Church is the parish church for the Aventine Hill. Some frescoes here are by Baroque painter Anastasio Fonteboni, who died in 1626. Sant'Andrea della Valle is from the 17th century and part of the building of great churches during the Counter-Reformation. The life and death of St. Andrew are major themes of the artwork here. St. Anthony of the Portuguese is the National Church of Portugal. It was built between 1624 and 1638. Located outside the walls of Rome, St. Sebastian Outside the Walls was built many centuries ago but later rebuilt in the 1600s. It was dedicated to St. Sebastian, the martyr we discussed earlier who was shot with arrows, left for dead, recovered, and was later martyred on the steps of the Temple of Elagabalus. The likeness of St. Sebastian was created by Giuseppe Giorgetti, a student of Bernini. The statue is considered to be his greatest masterpiece. The Chapel of Relics is home to the relics of many saints. 
And this is Salvator Mundi, the last sculpture by Bernini, made in 1679 when the artist was 80 years old. This is the National Church of Burgundy in France and was built in the 1700s. It has perpetual Eucharistic adoration. At a side altar is the body of St. Peter Julian Emart, founder of the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament. San Agata in Trastevere was here for many years before being rebuilt in the 1700s. In this church is a greatly treasured statue of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. It is said that a similar wooden version of the statue miraculously appeared at the Tiber River during a vicious storm in 1535. Since then, there has been a strong devotion to Our Lady as the protector of Trastevere. This church is dedicated to the guardian angels and was rebuilt in the early 18th century. With both reform and the Renaissance, Rome has experienced a rebirth. Many challenges await the Eternal City as we journey through the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries in our next episode.